Yeah, I have to say I'm, I'm a little bit, bit more hardcore archaeologist, not so much conceptual. So uh, this is will be some kind of. Um, I will try to show what we are working in OSIEC because uh, actually what we are doing is really a hardcore archaeology and excavation, but we have this some kind of problems that can relate to the to the papers before me. Um, so OSIEC is situated in the eastern part of Croatia. It's a uh, well less known Croatia. Basically, everybody knows my, uh, our country from, from this coastal part, which is known for the towns that have basically continuity continuity from antiquity. So I'm originally from Split. So you have Diocletian palace, you have the palaces from the early medieval periods, from the uh, Renaissance period, from basically all, 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 stra all uh, phases of the development of the town. But in this inner part, in the, in the Pannonian part of the Croatia, we have the, quite the opposite. And there we have the discontinuity, and, and that I will show you on the, on the example of Osik. This is one problem. The second problem is that I really want to relate to what you said in the, in the introduction. Uh, while on the coast, we have this huge influx of tourists, especially while well, Dubrovnik is now really quite a phenomenon because of the Game of Thrones and everything. But now also my home, hometown of Split and the Airbnb um, plague uh, basically uh, made all people move out from the uh, cent city center and it, it literally became uh, one um, huge uh, hotel, uh, well, I don't call it, uh, complex. And so in, in the, and the problem with the archaeology is that the archaeology is now actually perceived as something that has to uh, be in service of the tourism and of the tourists. And on the opposite, in the continental part, you don't have tourists. Uh, you have, well, nothing. Actually, this is the, the, the this is the, 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 we have this huge problem while you have the increase of the, of the inhabitants in the coastal parts, at least in this summer season, where you have, uh, where you have basically 50 or 60,000 people coming to the town. Example of Osiak and the other parts, but this has also happened in Hungary, Serbia, and all over the region. You have basically the huge emigration, especially when we became the part of the European Union. 20% uh, uh, of the inhabitants of Osiak emigrated to the western part. So while on the coast we have the pressure on the, on the real estate and on the buildings and the development, in, uh, in these inner cities, especially in this Danube part, we have basically decrease of the of the population, and of course, this is not the problem of archaeology because how can you explain to general population and to the municipality why they should spend so much money of such expensive thing as it is archaeology, and because of the archaeological projects are really considerable, uh, well, they cost. So what we are actually trying to do through this project that I'm in charge of is to present them why archaeology could be important and that not just because of the tourism. And the thing is, Osik is a very good example. So actually we have four cities, as Italo Calvino said, invisible cities, right? But uh, and in, the, in, the, in the example of Osik, this is really true. Basically, uh, Osik had this well, shall we say normal uh, evolution. First, it was Roman colony. Then, on the outskirts of the Roman colony, a small medieval settlement was, uh, well, grew, and then it became small medieval town. And then, when Ottomans came, and then uh, it became the part of the Ottoman Empire, and then transformed this small medieval town into a quite a large uh, regional urban center with at least a dozen of mosques and a huge bazaar, which was the, basically the commercial center of this part of, well, of the Ottoman Empire. But then uh, Austrians came, and uh, quite uh, surprisingly, they decided to build on the place of the Ottoman town a huge Baroque fort, which is now some kind of now symbol of Osik. But actually, that meant that they eradicated everything what preceded this Austrian, uh, well, uh, sort of occupation, or at least push to the to this part of the of the of the Pannonian plain. 
So this mean this meant that everything from medieval Ottoman for, for, uh, an Ottoman era was basically eradicated from the memory and from the landscape as itself. So what we actually wanted to do is to present now what you can see. Now, now you have this, in the center of Rosic, you have this uh, Baroque fort, and then you have that, we call it the, the cannon uh, zone that was uh, impossible to, to build. And then on the outskirts of that, uh, upstream and downstream of the river Gra Grau, uh, they, they built a civil settlement, which are basically now the centers of this new town. Uh, Two distinct uh, uh, archaeological sites we are now uh, registered. One uh, in pink is the part of the former Roman colony, and the yellow one is this medieval and Ottoman part of the town, of the site. So first, um, of this some kind of, well, uh, I have to say that Osek has this rich history of the archaeology, but 99% of it is rescued archaeology. So everything what was excavated and well, uh, research was destroyed with the modern development. Nothing w can be seen, actually, although you have this huge uh, archaeological, uh, well, heritage. First, uh, there was this example of the, uh, of the Ottoman archaeology in the 80s. They tried, they excavated uh, uh, the largest mosque of the, of the town. There was this small turba, but also there is the part of the mosque. But as you can see, it was like they wanted to present it as a kind of um, outline it on the pavement, as you can see it. But now today, a, m a large part of it is basically a parking lot. So now, uh, if somebody really is n don't know that the, th that the mosque was there, it can't be seen. Uh, so this was obviously something that was not, well, so good example of what to do in the future. So. Well, when I started to be involved in this project in 2012, we tried to do it in the other part, in the part, which this is now the cloister of the Franciscan monastery. We knew that there, on the, that there was a mosque, but also uh, the, this mosque was basically transformed church from the medieval period. So our idea was to excavate a part of this, um, of, this of, the, of, the, of the town, where you can see these layers of first Gothic church and of later mosque. But as you can see, uh, Franciscan, when they build this new church on top of it, they really made really good effort to eradicate mosque. So we couldn't find even the, even the basis of mosque. Everything was de destroyed. Only this remaining was this Gothic church. And this is what we actually, on the end, we tried to, to present it. And now it is seen, well, this is at least from the drone. You can see it, but again, we have other problem that, uh, that also I can relate to this public and um, private uh, space. The problem is that it is now part of the um, of the monastery, and monks really are not really inclined to show to let public in to see these remains. So again, it is invisible to general public, although we did excavate it. Uh, we tried uh, then to go to this other part. This is the city gates, first of the both medieval and Ottoman town. But unfortunately, what we learned well now was that both uh, medi medieval people from the medieval period and Ottoman basically had, um, uh, well, first a lot of it was made of wood and of earth. We didn't call it city gates, but we did find some examples of the of the Turkish presence there. But it was unfortunately something that was not presentable as the archaeology. So when we saw that this is something that is going in the wrong way, we shifted to the to the, to the Roman town, and this is um, well something that was really good for me because I'm a Roman archaeologist, and I was really happy about it because um, Mursa is well this part of the empire rather well known town because it was uh, founded by the Hadrian and along with Elia Capitolina which is today Jerusalem it is the last uh, last example of the veteran colony which was built ex nihilo so um, after this period after 133 all new colonies were basically transformed from the existing town only the Jerusalem and Osif were examples where you had completely new built town. 
And this is something, a good story that we could, of, of course, with it, all this. And it was the second thing is that it was built on the Limes. And now we've got this huge project which trying to enlist Limes, at least this venue part of the Limes, into the UNESCO heritage list. So Mursa should be part of it because Limes literally went through the town. And all oh, the town was built on the Limes Road. But what we really wanted to uh, show both to the public and to the municipality is that the biggest, well, importance of the town is the town out, town's outline itself. Because it is the last example of this Roman urbanism, which is in well, whole uh, integral in, the, uh, in this place. So what we wanted to go is to go first throughout the, to, the, to the town where we know that the, there is a column was to find the, the remains of it. I should say again, there is not a single wall or, or stone that you can see today. Everything is covered by the modern town and the Baroque part of the, of the settlement. Luckily we had this, uh, this geographical map of this of the fort, you can see the fort, which this, part, this time eradicated the, the, uh, the, the, the medieval town and the Ottoman town, which existed here. But luckily on this part of, uh, of, the, of the area, uh, military surveyors uh, actually mapped quite in detail uh, the outlines of the Roman city walls and some, well, some uh, buildings within it, the constructions. The second story that, uh, uh, and this was the first guide where to go because today this is everything is covered by the town. Now the thing, the second problem with uh, what we saw with the Roman time is that actually the Roman uh, remain, remains, remains were used for development also in the, 19, in the 18th and the 19th century. Basically, they tore down everything. In this, in this time, in the, in the second part of the 18th century, you could still see the city walls, which were five or six meters above the ground. But then in the uh, later centuries, they were used as a material for the building or for at least for the leveling in the, sur the uh, surrounding area. So again, it, they were leveling, leveled, leveling down. But with uh, geophysics, with some, as I said, previous uh, RECSCO excavations, what we had data in the archive, we could reconstruct the positions of the main roads, of the city walls, and of the ditches. And what we really wanted to do now is to um, choose the part of the towns where, this, where they could be ex uh, excavated and not destroyed by the modern development. This is the... Uh, the uh, uh, this outline as we know it today. Now, the second part, uh, the third uh, reason why this project was actually uh, started was this area here. And this is the western suburbia, or the, the western pa part west of the city walls, which, is, which was for the, well, for the past 200 years, a military uh, b barracks, first of the Austrian, and then of the Yugoslav, and then again of the Croatian army. And the good thing is, was that the large part of this area was um, uh, undeve undeveloped, just part of it. And in the 20 years ago, they were given to the University of Osijek so they could build their campus. And that's where the story begins. Uh, and uh, and uh, the big problem, because uh, we knew that there was a Roman town beneath it and uh, that a excavation has to be done. But what we really shocked that uh, nobody really wanted to acknowledge this. So um, we knew that there was, I will show you this. Maybe this is the better, better example of it. So this is the excavated area. They, we excavated around 40,000 40, square meters. And it is one of the largest examples of the uh, excavated suburbia in the Roman Empire, at least in the European part. And, uh, um, but and what what could be what was could be done was that this Roman road that was went through into the the Roman colony could be used as some kind of the pavement or out the part of uh, where you could walk uh, to it and uh, organize the future campus around it. What there what literally was done everything was built across it 
destroying it and without any uh, exam any possibility to to uh, show it in the form of the open area uh, presentation. Uh, I, I have five minutes more if I may. Five minutes. Okay. Great. No problem. So what, uh, what actually what we saw that uh, of all these four hectares of the uh, excavated area, everything what you can see is, is this here is basically the, this basement presentation of 500 square meters. And this is what was really a problem. What we really wanted to do, this is the present situation. We are currently excavating here in this part. We are twice trying to force them because green areas will be future buildings. And what you can see here are the well, con are the build Roman buildings that are ex excavated and pre presently being conserved, which were really trying to force them in some way to change their well, plans to build it in a way so this can be recognized. The blue lines are the is the, are, is the Roman street, and this and this are of course the Roman buildings. But unfortunately, I don't th think that we will manage to do it. The only way is to, uh, is to do it is to go to the green areas, to the city parks, and to do work in it. What we really done, and we were really, really we had really fortunate that we found a, a Carbus, a Carbus a Carbo Maximus. So this is something that can be preserved. This is the this is what we are planning to do, and we are trying to work out with the municipality to to not just to fund us. It's impossible, but at least to give us support into trying to find funds, but it is something that's really hard going, it's going hard. This is the present situation, and we are going to the, uh, uh, well, next month in the first way to, cons uh, to conserve it. But um, it's, it's, it's uh, really hard to do it, um, because this is the third example of uh, the, again, of the, the not successful, uh, successful presentation and this is the eastern part of the of the town where we excavated and found the eastern suburbia with the suburban villas but again there was really not any way of the way to present it because the investor which is local municipality simply did, did want, didn't want to acknowledge it today this is the present uh, situation the suburban villas are here. Uh, the idea was that we should excavate and they, in this kind of caseta to present what we really found. But what we really saw that you can't do it in the way the architects wanted to do it. So what we wanted to uh, plan in the future is to excavate this yellow line, which is the city, eastern city wall, to, in a way to present it and to uh, try to invoke it into, into a local uh, well into urban landscape. The problem is, and I will conclude, is that um, when you have the, not just municipality, but the general public, which really keen into eradicating everything what was before them, and where you don't have the possibility to see them, why it's really important to show material evidence that there was people who lived in the same area before them, then you have a really big problem. And the archaeology actually is now showing to me, I wasn't before, aware before it, that the archaeology is basically the only tool to force people to, uh, to show them that pe things were different, that they could be different, and well, many, uh, especially politicians, don't like that. And well, I will conclude with that. Thank you.